in addition to the complete theory to the one I mentioned, and that usually means a very, very high degree of control over this theory. So that means in this setup, you can usually explicitly calculate physical observables on the quantum field theory side as well as on the gravity side. And then you can explicitly compare them and see whether or not they match what you would call your all gravity equation. Now, going a little bit more on the technical side of things, it's not only conceptually it was easier working with those dimensions, it's also easier on the technical side. Why? Because in two on dimensions, you have a very neat reformulation of gravity advantage called the transcendence gauge theory. So that means you take uh, the drive band, the spin connection to those one dimensions, you recombine them into a single gauge field, which you know if you have 38, and then you can write down an action like this, this is called the Chazan's action, and this is basically exactly the same as the einstein dish interaction in the Palatini formalism after some arm. And the nice thing is, if you now want to realize certain kinds of space times, the only things you have to take care of is, okay, what value, so we, uh, what value, where does my gauge field take its values? So which gauge after does it take its values like this? I've shown you here the two most important space times from the thesis, which is ADS3, flat space. And what you want see here, okay, if we want to realize an ADS3 space time, what I have to take care of is that my uh, gauge field A has to take its values in two copies of S and This is what you would call the usual speed 2 gravity. This is where the uh, deeper Morphous invariance and negative cosmological form. Now, why is this nice? Well, you call the magic and the powerful aspects of the usual application here is to treat gravity. That's the first thing. The second thing is treating the high spin, these high spins, which we mentioned briefly, is it's very, it's very easy in comparison to trying to form an everything in the second sort of formulation. So if you say, okay, this would be spin 2 gravity, if you want to go, let's say, spin n gravity, there are two things you have to take care of. One thing is, okay, you basically just enlarge the random gauge algebra. And the second thing you have to take care of is, okay, I want an extension of different morphisms. So I still have to take care of how I implement the different morphisms in the extended extensions. There is on the mathematical side the question, how do I embed for AES, as it would as an There are different ways of doing this, and depending on what you do is to get different kinds of physically distant ice cream theory. Okay. Now, zooming in on my like Looking far away, from far away from my thesis, you can basically divide it into two parts. One is the non ADS has been along two part. We basically try to find preliminary evidence that there indeed can be holographic correspondences in all non ADS uh, space times as well as including high spin symmetries. So, what's the basic thing that I try to do here? Yeah, well, I try to do it so what as in both analysis, this is what's basically sketched shear this to not try to decide for everything that's written here. The detail I just want to show you, there is a well defined algorithm you can do. Uh, and I will briefly explain now how this works. So, the basic idea is okay, you take your space time into those dimensions. You specify a certain set of boundary conditions. This is the most important part because this will decide what kind of physics you will get at the boundary. And then you check okay, what kind of gauge transformations preserve my boundary conditions. Then you model the trivial boundary, uh, the trivial gauge transformation in the boundary, and what you end up is what's called an asymptotic symmetry algebra. So the asymptotic symmetries of your space times under the boundary conditions you have imposed. And these symmetries would be the basic for the proposed new field theory that you have. Because once you have found such an asymptotic symmetry algebra, you can then start to ask, ask questions like, okay, what about unitarity? Can I realize the symmetries in a unitary way? And if yes, is there a physical model? Part. Is there a physical model that realizes these symmetries in the universe? And if you find such a model, then you can say, okay, this is my proposed gravity rule. This quantum field theory is my proposed rule theory. And then you can start calculating physical observables you're interested in. You can try to uh, calculate the same thing with gravity side, compare them, and see if they match. And if they match, then you're basically in business because then you'll take the first non trivial steps to establish a new model. The second part of my thesis is basically concerned with the special part of the non antony sigma uh, holography example, which is flat space holography. And the basic idea is that uh, to try and see whether or not it's possible uh, or find more evidence to relate the freedom living in the asset of the boundary of flat space, the past and not future infinity, with uh, geometrical uh, invariance in the part of the space time. Okay. I'm going a little bit more into detail. What did I do on the non ADS has been part? I was mainly focused on the so-called Chevsky space time. So, this
this is basically very easy to imagine. Just imagine if the real line. And at every point of the real line, you attach a two-dimensional uh, um, Lobachevsky plane, which is again a uh, space with constant angle curvature, two dimensions in this case. And then I tried to answer the following questions. Well, are there consistent boundary conditions for all embeddings of SL2R and SL4R? That means for a certain kind of different high speed theories. I tried to find the same consistent boundary conditions for a whole family of special embeddings of W, W, and algebra. And then I wanted to answer questions like unitary representations of such symmetries. And I find unitary representations for generality. Now, on the flat space side, we can again divide this into parts. I was first focused on the gravity side. So there I tried to see okay, can I take limits of vanishing cosmological constant from known ADS logarithm result in order to learn something about that? This logarithm is something useful. The second part is can I again do higher spins? And still get a unitary theory at the boundary, unitary theory. And can I have chemical potentials as well as social tool as well as high spin chemical potentials? The second part uh, is concerned with an explicit non trivial check of the possible holographic correspondence in flat space. That is, calculating holographic entanglement entropy and thermal entropy of so called cosmological solutions in flat space. So, since it will not have time to explain everything in detail, I will focus on this part because it is uh, the nice thing to present uh, such a talk. And give you now a brief upshot of the results of these parts. So this is pretty easy because these are basically yes no questions and the thing is I can project my everywhere because yes, yes, yes. I found consistent boundary conditions for all these examples. I found the representations of such two uh, the asymptotic symmetries. Now you might ask, okay that's all nice and neat, I don't know so there is no explicit uh, result here. What, what, what's the point to take away home from this? Well, the nice thing is, the uh, thing to take home from this is, when I looked at the unitary representations of these stuff with N algebra, I found something peculiar. And that is, these algebras uh, contain something that's called a central charge. And this is an object that basically counts the number of states in your theory. And the nice thing is with this kind of algebras was that you can have a central charge that can both be very small and very large at the same time, while still retaining unit character of the model. And what that means in this context is that I found a possible family of quantum gravity groups, let's say, point models of quantum gravity to be more precise. Now, the flat space holography side, the gravity side, the limiting procedure from ADS3 needed many interesting results, but I think the most interesting one was that I was able to derive in this way uh, so called cardiac formula of flat space cosmology, that is basically a formula that microscopically counts the number of states of cosmological solutions in flat space. That's the meaning of such a formula. Now, regarding this higher spin story, I think the higher spins and the interrogative flat space was rather surprising at first sight because it found comparatively restringent and low result in certain assumptions. That is, on the assumptions I made, you cannot have flat, spin, flat space, higher spins, and interrogative at the same time. Which was the first side of the disappointing, I have to say, but we'll see doing more stuff in this direction. Uh, and then the high-spin chemical potentials is again potentially a yes no question, and yes, it was possible, but there's also something to learn from this. Uh, what's the point to learn from this? Adding the chemical potentials also allowed me to determine the thermal entropy of flat space cosmologies, even with high spin term. And the nice thing is that I now had a way to check whether or not the limits uh, I made, the assumptions I made in order to do the limit were sensible or not. Because the uh, results I got from this uh, calculation match exactly the ones coming from the limit. So, also confirming some assumptions I made doing the limit from the ADS results. What's the take home message from here? That's a little bit more critical, maybe. But I think the most important insight here was that unitarity in flat space, or the, for the issue of flat space holography, is more subtle than one would have expected at the beginning, or is more subtle than the ADS. Okay. Now, Going to my favorite side, I really like this side because it contains so much information it's comparatively simple. And I want to explain to you what is first what is entanglement entropy, then what is holographic entanglement entropy, and then I want to cross the bridge how to calculate these things in flat space and what's including high space. So, first of all, what you see here is again the Penrose diagram of AS3, and this is the representation of the dual uh, conformity here. It's basically a CFT in a line. So, first of all, imagine you have a system that is a line. And then you divide the system into two parts. 
into region A in this component. And then you can ask the question, OK, what is the amount of entanglement between these two regions, between region A and region B? And one possible measure of the amount of entanglement is given by entanglement entry. And you can calculate this in a, for, for, for single systems in the following way. You first determine the reduced density matrix of system A, that is, the trace of the increase of freedom of system B. And then you take the trace row over row of this expression, and then you end up with an entropy, which is called the entanglement. Now the problem is, as soon as the system gets a little bit more complicated than the line, uh, then this computation gets either impossible to perform or horribly complicated. There are tricks to circumvent this on the quantum field theory side, but also these techniques have the limits. And now the next thing is, I think it was a couple of months ago, or exactly 10 years ago, Shin Seliu and Taisu Kakianagi proposed the holographic way to determine the source of this entanglement. And they showed explicitly that it works. And their proposal was, OK, you take, in this case, A is 3. Then you attach a geodesic <coughs> line with minimal length at your boundary in such a way that it hangs into the hull. And that the points where it's attached uh, are the boundaries of your boundary interval. And then the proposal is, OK, the length of that object, the length of the geodesic, is dual to entanglement entry. And if you think about it, that statement is enormously brilliant and beautiful on many, many levels. First of all, the simplicity. I mean, this is, if you just think about gravity and on dimensions, that's something everybody can calculate by hand. That's usually what students learn when they first take the first GR process and how to calculate geodesics. The second thing is, in my personal opinion, what makes this very, very beautiful, is it relates to seemingly completely different things, or completely different concepts. The first one is a purely geometric statement. It should be something that only knows something about geometry. And entanglement entropy, on the other hand, is something that only knows something about quantum information. So you have a relation between geometry and quantum information, which is, in my opinion, a rather surprising connection. Now, the question is, OK, this is nice and neat if you have some kind of geometric description of the at your disposal, but what, for instance, happens if you have something like that spin symmetries in the game where the geometric implementation is not always nice and neat possible. Now, the answer to this question is the transimus formulation again comes to save your day because you have something like gauge invariance, you have a notion of gauge invariance, and that is you can find an object that is gauge invariant even under high spin transformations and that does exactly the same thing as a geodesic would do in a geometric formulation. And that is a Wilson line. So a Wilson line is Basically, what I thought is a gauge invariant object that you can attach to the point so that you can let run around in circles. That basically also gives you the entanglement entry to do it properly. This is what Martin Armand and Alexander Krasnov and Billy Equal, as well as Jan Dua found about almost uh, years ago at the same time. And physically, you can imagine this as some topological code. You, you say, okay, you let it start at one uh, um, boundary point of your interval, you let it travel around the park. And the Wilson line collects information, so this object is mass and spin, and collects information about geometry, and then gives you a response in form of entanglement. That's the basic idea. And when I saw this proposal, I thought, okay, since this only relies on the symmetries of the problem, this has to work for class space. And I tried to apply this to class space. And the thing is, I can say it works, but there are two caveats. There are two things you have to take into account. And these two problems are first ones. And in order to do this, at first I want to show you how things work in the AS case really briefly conceptually. And then I will show you what's the problem, how does it work in flat space, and how can we solve the problem. That's the most important So in AES, the main point here is, is the isometries are given by two copies of S and R, and there are symmetries symmetries by two copies of the Virasol algebra. The important point here is that the Virasol algebra contains again the same charges I mentioned in the before, which is called C and C bar. And the nice thing is that these symmetries are a direct sum. That's an important point here. Since these are a direct sum, and the Wilson line is something that works on the group level, you get also a really nice split of these uh, Wilson line into a direct product that contains information about one central charge and the other central charge. Accordingly, also the entanglement entropy splits into two contributions that contains information about C and C bar. Now, how does this work in flat space? In flat space, you have the isometries R, S, R, and S, and symmetries B and S3. Again, the details are not too much important. Important, but here there's again a central charge CL and a central charge CM with character and the algebra in the physical concept. And the nasty thing about this thing is that this is not a direct sum anymore. This is a semi-direct sum. 
So the Wilson lines were not split as easily as in the ADS case. Now you might say, okay, why would you bother? Why is this important? That's the way it is, deal with it. The thing is, why I did bother back then was that I had two independent things that it actually should split. One was the limiting procedure I mentioned briefly before. And the other one were independent calculations coming from a proposed routine theory, which is called a latent routine theory, that both showed such a split in general. Now, how to remedy this situation? With a little bit of hindsight, it's comparatively easy. I mentioned the physical interpretation of Wilson as a probe with mass elements in as well as the bulk. The thing is, you can achieve such a split if you just choose, choose a specific kind of probe. And if you choose a probe that already incorporates the split on the group level, then everything works fine, you get a split in general. And the entanglement entropy also splits into two contributions that will be proportional to this center charge C and C N. Now that was the first problem. The second one is more a fundamental one or a conceptual one that is related to the dual quantum field theory. In AES, the dual quantum field theory is component field theory. That also means you have a relativistic theory at hand. So that means it does not matter which slicing you take and where you, uh, where you violate your entanglement entropy. So the entanglement entropy does not change the choice of frame. On, in the flat space case, however, since the dual uh, symmetries are governed by Galilean conformal symmetries, the name already suggests there's something different, uh, Galilean symmetries are not relativistic anymore. So in this case, it actually does make a difference which slice you take, and entanglement entropy will be in the choice of frame. So in order to take this into account in your calculation, you not only have to separate the Wilson line into a space like region, but also in a time lag form. Now, having solved these two problems, you basically have a nice neat little black box in your suppose that you can feed with geometric information, and that then should give you something back, something with quantum information. So this would be entanglement. And the information that I would feed this machine is flat space, so this is flat space in a special set of coordinates. <coughs> you have some time coordinate u, some radial coordinate r, and angular coordinate phi, and two functions m and n that in principle, in principle be functions of u and phi, but I would assume to be constant for the purpose of this talk. And just to briefly flash you how such a connection, I talked about connections and algebra, just how this looks like. If you take such a connection, then this will reproduce this kind of line element, and depending on how M and N behave with different kinds of solutions. If M and N are not equal to zero, you get this cosmological solution that I mentioned previously. If M is equal to minus N equals to zero, you get a global flat space. And if both are equal to zero, you get an orbital solution. Now, for the purpose of entanglement entropy, maybe let me just focus on global flat space case. So, what I want to do now, okay, I feed this information of this media with my entanglement entry black box that I developed before, and then I will get something out. And what I get out of this calculation, something very nice and easy, is that you see, as promised, uh, you get the split in the contribution of CL and CM. So you see the dependence uh, of your choice of frame in this case. And the nice thing about this result is that it precisely matches the limiting procedure, it precisely matches the dual quantum field theory calculation. And thus, I think it's safe to say you have three independent checks of such a thing that we have found the Holographic and way to calculate holographic entanglement and to be involved in that space time. And with this, since my time is up as well, uh, I want to conclude. Well, what were the main points? The main points was interested in okay, can you have one AES or two in unitarity? This is a big part of my thesis. And happily, I just put the check mark here. It is really possible, at least it seems to be possible. I also found more evidence that there is actually a holographic correspondence in that space with this explicit check. For example. And going back to the questions that I posed on my first slide, uh, I think my thesis was also able to show that you indeed can have uh, holographic correspondences without AES, and that you do not have to restrict yourself to only intermorphism. This you can also simultaneously go beyond. So to wrap up, uh, I think that by now there's more and more evidence collecting that indeed there is a more fundamental connection in general between theories of gravity and quantum field theories governed by something like all of the holographic principle or if you want general holographic principle. And with this I want to thank you very much for your attention.